There's not only a poverty problem in the United States, there's also a generosity problem. Individual and society attitudes toward poverty need urgently to change. The American Religious Town Hall meeting is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall Meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here is your host and moderator. Welcome, viewers. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Andrea Luxton. I'm president of Andrews University in Michigan and will be today's moderator. We have a very important uh, topic ahead of us, but before we get into that, let's meet today's panelists. My name is Bishop Michael Olson, and I serve as the Bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. My name is Mel Robeck. I'm Senior Professor of Church History and Ecumenics and Special Assistant to the President for Ecumenical Relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I also serve as a minister of the Assemblies of God. Hi, I'm Rabbi Dan Levin. I serve as senior rabbi at Temple Bethel in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm Tom Plumley. I'm a minister in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. I serve as the senior minister at First Christian Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you all very much to our panelists for being with us today. And now to today's topic. Michael Tubbs, in a 2021 article entitled Fixing Americans' Poverty Problem Starts with Telling a New Story, argues that the problem of poverty in the United States will not be addressed until we can, quote, disrupt and replace the current narrative on poverty based on racist, classist, sexist, and xenophobic stereotypes. It's a narrative that blames people for their struggles labeling them as lazy, corrupt, unintelligent, or worse, and deems them undeserving of our trust, our investment, or even their own dignity." End of quote. Tom <coughs> speaks from the experience of being mayor of Stockton in California, and in 2019, seeking to bring measures that would frame a different narrative. Tubbs assumes in this article that we do have a poverty problem, and data certainly seems to support that. The latest data on poverty from the U.S. Census Bureau, the 2019 American Community Survey five-year estimates, places the U.S. poverty rate nationally as 13.4%. This means that 13.4% of the national population lives below the poverty line. While this figure was an improvement from the 15.6% figure from five years earlier, that improvement does not imply that the U.S. has in place the structural mechanisms to improve the lives of those living below that poverty line. In addition, of course, the pandemic has added additional pressures to certain groups dealing with poverty. So with all this in mind, the panelists are asked to reflect on at least the following questions. First of all, would you agree with Tubbs' assertion that fixing the poverty problem starts with telling a new story? If so, what might that new narrative be? Secondly, are the solutions to poverty personal attitudes, or are they the structures embedded in society, or both, or something else? And finally, what is the role of faith communities in responding to the challenges of poverty around us? I'd like to turn to those that started our conversation today for their first comments. There is a poverty problem in the United States, and uh, we have a standard of living that is, uh, shows just how blessed we are as a nation with so many resources and so many uh, talents. But when people fall below that standard of living in, in poverty, they fall deep. 
all right, in the sense that so much of what we do just to form a society requires a given amount of resources financially to to uh, take part in that, that uh, any any dip below that line, people have have a hard time, if not an impossible time, to get out of that just simply by the power of their own bootstraps. I think that, uh, you know, for, in our tradition is that we can eradicate poverty if we see the poor as people who belong to our society and not just simply put an emphasis on fitting into our society in the sense of belonging and that they participate in uh, the common good, in our, you know, just they're physically present around us. And so to help somebody get out of the scourge of poverty requires, in a sense, more than money. It's not just simply throwing money at a problem, though it does cost some money. Uh, and it's also uh, something like education, though it's more than education. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sense of the, recognizing their human dignity as a person with a name, uh, with a story, who may suffer mental illness or some other, uh, some other infirmity that's placed them into a situation like this. Uh, I think case management is very important when it comes to helping people get out of poverty. In other words, that there's never just one cause for poverty. Uh, and certainly indolence or, or laziness is never the primary cause, if it's, and it's seldom present at all. Uh, but rather, things like mental illness, things like being able to learn how to budget, uh, to, to avoid uh, predatory lenders uh, that prey upon the poor with exorbitant interest rates. Uh, that's something that we can do in society as well that facilitates people uh, being able to live above poverty. And, and finally, I would add one other thing, is that um, I think in our culture and certainly in our media and the way we, we uh, live, I think we place too high of a value on material wealth. Uh, we worship money. And uh, the, the independence, the freedom, the autonomy that we think money brings. And that autonomy is really a denial of our responsibilities to be in relationship with each other and with society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bishop. Um, I think you bring up a very uh, important point, and that is that we are a very wealthy country. We can do pretty much anything we want to. I, and I've traveled a lot around the world, and especially in the global uh, south, and I have seen poverty firsthand that does not compare to the kind of poverty we have in the United States. That said, uh, we have uh, what, close to 15% living in poverty or below the poverty line. That poverty line is set quite low. Um, I'm just trying to think about, uh, I have a son who's a on a, uh, who has a disability and he will be on disability for life. He gets about $1,200 a month. $1,200 a month doesn't work out to very much uh, per annum. And it's below the poverty line. Um, the city of Pasadena says, I have a, a small apartment that we built on the back of our garage that my son lives in. It's a studio apartment. Uh, they say, you should be charging $2,100 a month for that. My son could not possibly live in that place if I were to charge him that kind of rent. So, uh, you know, we have a real problem. And I think in, in retrospect, I think many of our politicians have decided to blame the victim. Uh, we, we're really good at that. You know, they're uh, ignorant, they're apathetic, they're dishonest, they're uh, dependent. You know, they're all, all these kinds of things. They're lazy, they're criminal. And they're criminal. You know, all of those kinds of things are, those are easy, easy uh, measurements, I suppose, if that's what you want to say. But I do think that part of our problem is that we revile history. Mm -hmm. History tells us the truth. And the reality is we have a history of slavery that has left people impoverished for 200 years, 250 years. We have a history of running over indigenous people, putting them on reservations. And where do they go on those reservations? To the worst spots we could possibly think about living 
in the middle of deserts with lack of water, with lack of resources, and we say, you're a sovereign nation, do what you want, until we say, no, you can't do that. So we have these kinds of issues and these kinds of problems, and I think we have to be really honest. In fact, one of the questions here, I think, was, um, uh, do you agree with Tubbs' assertion that fixing the poverty problem starts with telling a new story? Absolutely. It's called the truth. Rather than simply making up these kinds of ideas and saying, well, that's, that'll take care of it, and you know, we can ignore this or that. But we have to recognize that, that discrimination and uh, starting points uh, are very, very difficult to overcome, especially when you have been discriminated against all of your life, uh, and it goes back uh, for general, uh, uh, generations. I think Michael Tubbs, who uh, did some really creative stuff in Stockton, California, uh, regarding poverty. Unfortunately, he didn't get reelected, but he is working with uh, Governor Newsom on, on poverty in California. You know, he says it's not the job of the government to give everybody whatever they want. It is to make sure that the rules and the laws and the regulations are just. And that's, you know, that's where government can do some real changes. We have unjust rules, laws, and regulations that, in a sense, criminalize people for things that, that it's really impossible for them to control. And so, I, you know, I think uh, that that's there. But we, the people, are the government. It's not just those government people that we elect, but it's these people who elect those government people. What is it that's primary for us? What is it that our churches could say regarding the, uh, the, the uh, issues that are there without getting political, but, without look, uh, but looking at the moral and the ethical issues that face these people who are in poverty? Why can we not work together with government uh, to uh, make some changes in the way the laws are read or in the way the rules are. Or as you put, a very obvious one in my community is the predatory lenders. They're everywhere. And I look at grocery stores. I can go to a grocery store on one corner. I can go down six blocks to another corner in the poor section, and I will find the same uh, company running both stores, and they will have higher prices than they would if they shop down here. So it's a very difficult kind of thing, but I do think that we have the ability to make those kinds of changes, not only institutionally and systemically, but also person by person. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. So in Jewish tradition, the word for charitable giving is not called charity. It's in Hebrew, it's tzedakah. The root is tzedek, which means justice. You have scales and someone has plenty and someone doesn't have enough, those scales are out of balance. So it is an obligation. It's not if you feel like it. It's an obligation to take from what you have to balance those scales. And there is, I think, so much in our textual tradition that teaches us that we can't just do that so that somebody is fed or clothed, but that they have to be taken care of in a way that honors their essential humanity. So in Leviticus 19, we're admonished that when you harvest your field, you have to leave the edges and the corners unharvested and you have to leave the gleanings on the ground. So why, why can't I just harvest all the food and put it in a box next to my house and say, poor people come and take? And it was because the poor, the stranger, the vulnerable people needed to be given a dignified way to take care of themselves. It was also a message to the person who owned that field. I mean, think of what it took to harvest, to, to cultivate a field in the land of Israel in ancient times. That was a lot of backbreaking work. And now you're saying you don't get to harvest all of that? The answer is no, you don't. Because everything that you think is yours is not actually yours. That land belongs to God. And if you're lucky enough to be a tenant of it, to cultivate it and to get its riches from it, it's your obligation to then share that, to be generous, as you said, Bishop. But at the same time that we have a, an, an obligation to take care of the poor person who confronts us, we also, I think, as Tubb says, have an obligation to take care of the systems of poverty that create for generational poverty, that keep people in poverty. And one of the ways that I think tradition reminds us to do that, we see in Isaiah 58, where we're told, you've got to bring the poor into your own household. So what does that mean? It doesn't just necessarily mean I open the door and I invite people in for dinner. It's a way of saying, you are not the other. You are kin. You are family. 
And to kin and family, I owe a debt of obligation, of duty, to ensure that you are given the opportunity to lead an authentic and full life that is free from the shackles of poverty. I think the last thing I would share is, I think sometimes we make assumptions about what it is to be impoverished because of a reality we wish were true, uh, because it makes us feel better. I had a very generous member of my congregation come and offered to give a very, very generous gift to create a fund at the synagogue. And he says, here's the rules of the fund. I want it to be a case where someone would come and they had gotten down on their luck and they would need one gift and that would put them back, in, you know, they, they, they had stumbled or they had had a law, whatever it was, and they could get one gift one time and that would put them right. And I sat with him and I said, that's not how poverty works. The fact is that there aren't people in our community who have stumbled once, and if you just gave them one little gift, they'd be back to normal. The people in our community who are impoverished are dealing with issues of chronic need because of either physical inability or mental illness or depletion of resources or inability to gain meaningful employment because of ageism or other issues. They're going to be needy all the time. And if you say to them, you get one gift, but that's it, they're going to come back in a few months because their reality isn't going to likely change. And what we need to do is to figure out systems where we can change realities so that people who are chronically poor can escape from that vortex that holds them down. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Uh, just very quickly, because I think we're running out of time. Uh, I, I wanted to, Tubbs invited us to tell new stories. I want to start by telling a couple of old stories. Uh, one is that of uh, the, the Atlanta massacre of 1906, and the other is that of the Tulsa massacre of 1921, both of which were not just aimed at beating up folks of color, black people. Yeah. Those, they were aimed at destroying systems by which people of color were making it yeah. uh, and, and uh, making, making, it, making sure that they did not get into the, uh, uh, the, the system in our country that allows people to pull themselves up by, the, by their bootstraps, okay? Those are, those are a couple of old stories that tell us where we've been. And I also want to tell a couple of new stories, one of which is Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities in, in Fort Worth is the one I'm familiar with, and, and, and uh, Bishop Olson is, is in charge of that, um, uh, by extension. Uh, uh, but but, they, but they, they, do, they do some of the most wonderful work uh, for, for all sorts of people who are moving into our community and people who have been longtime residents there. And also, second story, new story, those who are fighting for our public schools, for, for bettering of our public schools, because, because folks are not going to get out of poverty if they can't add two and two. Folks are not going to get out of poverty if they don't know the history of their country. Um, uh, and so our public schools need to be supported. Um, uh, we, we can talk all day about, about redlining, about zoning, about all the, the things that have disproportionately affected the poor uh, and, and, and the ways that, that, that have affected, made, made people to, to stay in poverty. Um, uh, poverty is a, is a huge issue in this, in this country, in, in this world. Um, uh, you know, the difference between our part of the world and the rest of the world uh, is, 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 is unreal. Uh, uh, and so there, there is, this, this is, this is such an, such a, uh, a far reaching pro problem, but we, I, I admire Michael Tubbs for, for saying we must begin to tell our story in a different way. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, very much, Tom, at the end for there for shifting it towards a very practical side of this issue, which is the so what, 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 the, what does this actually mean? And, and there are good things happening, but we'll maybe hear, hear a little bit more after, after our commercial break, which is coming up now. We hope you're enjoying today's program.
If you'd like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the vision and history of the program, and we invite you to become a ministry partner, explore our Town Hall Estates healthcare facilities, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, we look forward to receiving your letters. You may write us at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas, 75218. If you have a prayer request, please send it to prayerrequest at americanreligious.org. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. Now, back to today's closing statements. Welcome back, viewers. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for being part of our, our community as we, uh, as we talk together on some of these really important conversations. Uh, we're now moving to our, our closing comments. St. Therese of Lisieux, a Catholic saint, once wrote, everything is a grace. In other words, everything is a gift. Uh, that we, in a sense, are responsible for really responding to God's grace and gratitude. Everything that's created is of God. And so we don't properly own anything in the sense of having total control for us to do whatever we want with it. When we use the word charity in the Catholic tradition, it really means to signify the life of the Trinity, which is love, that type of self-effusive love uh, that, that then comes into humanity through the incarnation of the second person of the Holy Trinity is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When we respond in charity, uh, it's not simply pity, uh, it's also manifesting God's love, which is just, which is merciful, which is constant, and which is always upholding our human dignity. Poverty is not a moral failing, uh, and it is also not something that a utopia can totally eradicate, but rather it's an issue of how do we belong and how do we recognize that we belong to each other within a society based in the family and not just fitting in to a society based on acquisition. I'm reminded uh, of an organization in our community uh, called Family Promise, which is a consortium of houses of worship that help to care for homeless families. And there was a woman with her two children who was homeless and was living in the group home through Family Promise that, that our people in our community got to know. Our community also runs an organization called The Giving Tree, which organizes Christmas gifts for indigenous families around holiday time. And every year we would go to an or a neighborhood that is a federal housing project that is in our community. And on Christmas Eve, we would go and someone would dress up as Santa Claus and pass out the gifts. And we knock on one door and it's this woman. She's overjoyed because she has a home. And we walk in and there's not even a, there's a mattress on the floor and a folded card table with mismatched folding chairs. And that was the extent of the furniture. And we said, oh my gosh, just wait till we're done distributing the gifts. We took her to the warehouse where our quiet giving program used, takes gently used furniture. And by one in the morning, she had a fully furnished apartment. That was one individual who was lifted out of poverty. But the way that you lift an individual out of poverty is when faith communities and community organizations and government programs all work together in harmony to create a system that leads someone to a different reality, whether it's opportunities for higher education or job training or other kinds of facilities. It's when we work together in concert doing the best of what each of us can provide that we find new stories to tell about how to bring people out of poverty. Yeah, I think the great news story that we need to tell is the, is the story of, of the generosity of spirit that moves us to recognize and admit the structural nature of poverty. Um, uh, Audre Lorde has said it is, it, is not si it is not difference that immobilizes us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. One of those silences, I think, uh, is the great silence between the poor and the machine that keeps them down. 
uh, uh, the, all our religious traditions shout uh, for us to, to stand up for the poor. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we tend to, uh, because it benefits us, to, to stand in, the, in, in silence. We need to stand up and to, and to speak out that uh, change needs to take place. New stories need to be told that our poor brothers and sisters might be helped. Someone famous once said, the poor you will always have with you. That didn't mean ignore the poor. It didn't mean leave them out there in the cold. It didn't mean, uh, you know, pay attention to other things. It meant uh, it was a reality check in, in many ways. Uh, but there were other concerns on this person's mind. I do think that in California, we are trying to do some things that are, are perhaps ahead of the rest of the nation, although the jury is still very much out on what we are trying to do in various things. One of the things that we are doing is guaranteed income in certain communities, especially low income communities, uh, decriminalizing homelessness and things adjacent to that uh, so that people have the opportunity to move ahead. Finding uh, housing for the poor, which I know that a lot of communities are doing, but in, uh, in LA area in particular, I would say they're doing an enormous amount of rebuilding the county hospital is going to be turned into a huge uh, center for homeless uh, people uh, with the uh, ability to uh, have an apartment, each one. Cash bail, uh, home buyer assistance, uh, zoning changes that allow for more than a single uh, uh, house on the property. All of these things I think have a, a something to contribute. And I think churches can get behind and, and synagogues can get behind some of these kinds of things. And we'll see how it works. Thank you. And thank you all very much. And I hope viewers that you have come up with some, some ideas today, ways that you can perhaps uh, place yourself within that story that of, the, of the poor in the future and, and how we move forward. The Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that uh, Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, educators and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed. So that the rest of the world can see that here in America we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory but in reality. And so now, friends, until next week at the same time and over the very same channel, the American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you.